Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and my guest for this episode is Dr. Naomi Oreskes. Dr. Oreskes is a world-renowned earth scientist, historian, and public speaker, as well as a leading voice on the role of science in society, the reality of anthropogenic climate change, and the role of disinformation and blocking climate action. She is the Henry Charles Leah Professor of the History of Science and Affiliated Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. Dr. Oreskes is the author or co-author of 10 books, including Why Trust Science, The Collapse of Western Civilization, Discerning Experts, and of course, the best-selling book, Merchants of Doubt, co-authored with Eric Conway. Merchants of Doubt has been translated into nine languages and was made into a documentary film of the same name. She is also author or co-author of over 150 articles, essays, and opinion pieces, some of which have appeared in leading newspapers around the globe, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the Times of London. Her numerous awards and prizes include the 2019 Geological Society of America Mary C. Rabbit Award, the British Academy Medal 2019, and the 2016 Stephen Schneider Award for Outstanding Climate Science Communication, to name just a few. She is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. In 2018, she was named a Guggenheim Fellow for her upcoming book with Eric Conway, The Big Myth, How American Business Taught Us to Loathe the Government and Love the Free Market, which will be out in February 2023. Wow, that is a truncated bio. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. I greatly appreciate it. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And for anybody that wants more information, you can go to her website, which I will post. The bio is quite outstanding. You have written extensively on a variety of topics. Today, much of our conversation will center on science, technology, and human values, and your book, Why Trust Science. But as we begin, I big into definitions, so to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. The details will be fleshed out in this conversation, but I'm wondering if you can give me a soundbite definition of science. Oh, that's a great question, because science is one of those words that we use all the time, and we often assume that our audiences know what we mean, and often they don't. So to me, science is an enterprise. It's an activity. It's the activity of trying to understand the natural world based primarily on empirical observation. And when I use the word science, I use it in the German sense of Wissenschaft, that is to say knowledge production, so broadly construed that when I use the word science, I also include the social sciences along with the natural sciences. Before we get into why trust science, I want to talk a little bit about science as it relates to technology, because, and especially from your perspective as a science historian, because many, many people, myself included, we think of technologies that they are the result of science. But it's not necessarily so, as technology may come first and the figuring out later. And for example, the Romans had technologies, but they didn't contribute that much to science. And the Greeks contributed a great deal to science, but were comparatively low in technology. And then weaponry like trebuchets, catapults, those were all invented without knowledge of physics, right? Smallpox inoculation from the skin scratch method method, or inhaling dried pus, that was around before the science of virology, immunology, germ theory of disease. So... Why do we need science? Can we get along without it? Well, that's a great question, and and you're absolutely right. The relationships between science and technology are much more complicated and varied than many people assume. So in the 20th century, a lot of people promoted or advocated what is sometimes called the linear model, that first we do the science, and then the science leads to the technology. So on that model, technology could really just be understood as applied science. But as you correctly said, the reality is so much more complicated than that. So we do have cases where scientific work definitely led to technologies. Uh, I think we saw that last year with the development of the COVID vaccine, that a group of scientists who had been working really hard on the whole science of messenger RNA were able to apply that uh, to create a technology to protect us from COVID-19. But there are also lots of examples where technology has been developed kind of independently or sometimes in parallel with scientific investigations. The way I think about it, and again, this is where I I do think the German word Wissenschaft is helpful because it literally means knowledge production or knowledge creation or knowledge craft, that often if we look at these older traditions, 
there is a kind of science taking place, or at least there's a kind of empirical tradition that people are making observations, but it's not systematized in the way that modern science is, and it's not institutionalized. So if we think about modern science, by which I mean roughly science since you know the early 17th century to the present, it's systematized. It's not just an individual messing around with cows and cow maids or something like that. Um, but it's it, it's organized. There's a kind of organized quality to the inquiry, an organized quality to the reporting of results. And it's institutionalized that scientists since the 17th century have developed institutions in which scientists can report back on their work, subject those reports to criticism and to scrutiny and revision. And it's this enterprise aspect of modern science that I think is really important for understanding its power, because much of what was done before the 17th century was interesting, uh, much of it was well-intentioned, and some of it actually figured out really important things, but it wasn't really organized and it wasn't really systematic, so there's a kind of somewhat random quality to some of these earlier developments that you talk about. Um, so it's really the systematization of knowledge in the modern world that most historians of science would really identify with what we call science today. Let me pick up on your word institutionalized, because that comes to my question, why, why does trust science seem so unique? And as you brought up institutionalized, I mean, we all trust experts such as plumbers, electricians, car mechanics, HVACs. I know there's surely bad actors sometimes, but that's not the majority. But when you say institutionalized, we all have personal interaction with our plumbers and electricians and whatnot. Is the lack of personal interaction what comes in when people, when you say why trust science? Because sometimes it's set aside and we're just listening, we're not interacting? Well, that's a great question. We don't have really good data. We don't have good scientific evidence about why people don't trust science when they, when they don't. And actually, I have a postdoc right now, Victoria Colonia. She's just about to launch a big multinational study to look more closely at when people trust science, and if so, why, and when people don't trust science, and if so, why, so we can try to get a better understanding. But I think your intuition is probably correct. Most of us trust our car mechanic because we have a personal relationship with the mechanic. Uh, maybe we've brought our car to him in the past, and it seems like it's all worked out okay. He did the repairs he said he would do, and our car ran again. But we don't have that kind of relationship with science or scientists. Most Americans don't know a single scientist, or if they do, they don't know that they know that person. Uh, most Americans can't name a single living scientist. And most scientists really have no, sorry, most people, most ordinary people really have no idea what it is that scientists actually do. And so part of the point of writing the book, Why Trust Science, was to open a window into this process and say, look, it's not magical. It's not mystical. It doesn't need to be shrouded in mystery. It's a human enterprise. The people who do it are, are ordinary people. They might be intelligent. They might not be. I know some scientists who aren't that bright. But you know, <laughs> the point is, they're ordinary people and they're doing a job. But it's a job that we don't understand very well because most of us don't encounter it in our daily lives. And we also don't encounter, at least in a formal way, the track record of science. So again, if you think about the plumber or the mechanic, if our plumber screwed up our pipes, we wouldn't go back to that plumber. Or if our mechanic charges us a lot of money, but then the problem with the car was not fixed, we wouldn't go back to that mechanic. We'd ask around and try to find a better mechanic. Science actually has a great track record of success, but most of us don't really know that much about it. I mean, we hear about these individual incidents. We know we sent men to the moon. Uh, we know we have vaccines, but the process by which this comes about is really shrouded in a lot of um, haze and fog. And so the point of the book was to try to kind of clear away the fog and say, look, this is this is what it looks like when you look closely. Um, and it's actually pretty good. So paraphrasing from Why Trust Science, let me your book, Why Trust Science, let me follow up with what you just said a little bit about we see results. If we don't get the results from our mechanic, we move on, right? It's not that we don't trust mechanics, say. So does trust in the concept of science, and this is paraphrased from your book, does it come down to, it's not individual scientists, but it comes down to the authentication method that guarantees results? Well, that that is my argument, although I wouldn't use the word guarantee. Okay. There are no guarantees in life. And I think one of the mistakes we make about science is thinking that somehow it's supposed to be foolproof so that when scientists do make errors, people say, oh, aha, look, they messed that up, as if somehow that invalidates the whole enterprise, which, of course, it shouldn't, because you might have a great mechanic you really like who might make a mistake one time, 
But if you've had a good track record overall, you'd probably cut that guy slack and say, okay, well, he messed up this time, but he's still a good guy. So in science, we do mess up. In a way, science requires us to mess up. The whole point of inquiry, of learning, of discovery is to try things. The whole notion of an experiment is that we try something to see if it works or not. So in science, scientists are constantly trying things that don't work, coming up with ideas that the evidence doesn't support, um, doing an experiment that fails. But in science, we use that to make progress, what we broadly call progress. That is to say, I have an idea. I'm not sure if it's right or wrong. So I test it. I make observations. I do an experiment. I build a computer model. I do a clinical trial. And then I get those results. And if the results appear to be working, if they appear to be pretty good, then I present those results to my colleagues. So in a way, my colleagues are almost like the consumers. I'm not selling I'm not selling my results to the general public, but I'm presenting them to my colleagues, and then they criticize them. And this is a part of science that I think many people don't understand if they've never actually been involved. Scientists are really mean to each other. They're really tough. They're very demanding, and they'll say, I don't believe that. I think you need more data, but what about this? It seems like you didn't take into account that. And the process is designed to do that deliberately. Say, if I, am a, if I review a scientific paper, I'm asked to find fault. I'm asked to say, you know, is this right? You Are you persuaded by the evidence? Is there enough evidence? And a paper doesn't get published in a scientific journal until it's essentially ran that gauntlet. And so we have a process for trying to identify error, for identifying mistakes, for identifying inadequacies, and then fixing them. Because if the paper is rejected, because the reviewers say, well, we don't think you have enough data, then the scientists can go back and collect more data. And so it's an iterative process, essentially a process of correcting error or identifying and fixing error. Um, and through that process, over time, we build up a body of robust knowledge. What you're speaking about now, it leads me right into another part of your book I want to talk about. And that is the social constructivism of science. And I know, I don't know, with social constructivism, the term's been around since, what, the 70s or the late 60s. And again, it's another one of those words people, it, it's got a lot of definitions and people think they know what it means. But really here, you're talking about science as a show. And I'm, again, paraphrasing from your book here, but I'd like you to speak about it a little bit because you're talking science as a social endeavor. And, but when people hear social constructivism, they might hear it as subjective or erratic or even compelled. But to the contrary, I think you wrote that objective, I'm sorry, objectivity itself may be a social accomplishment, something that's collectively achieved. Can you speak about that? That's what you're talking about when you send out papers for peer review and everybody jumps on it? Exactly. And I think you're right to raise a flag here because the phrase social construction really created a lot of heat back in the 70s, 80s, and still does today, and maybe arguably more heat than light because it did get conflated with a question of um, realism. Like, were we simply saying, were people simply saying, well, it's just a social construction that it has no relation to reality? Most people who became interested in the social construction of scientific knowledge were not saying that, but some of them were. And so it did create a lot of confusion. So I welcome the opportunity to clarify. So what I'm arguing for really falls into a, an area of um, academic work known as social epistemology. That is to say, to try to understand knowledge in social context and knowledge as a social product. Because if I believe something, let's say I do an experiment all by myself and I believe it and I think I have good data. Well, okay, I think I have good data, but it doesn't rise to the level of being knowledge until I persuade the other experts that it's true. Up until that point, you can think about me having this idea as the proverbial tree falling in the forest where no one hears. It might be a good idea. It might be a bad idea. And we don't know. And we're all rather bad at judging our own ideas. I think I talk about this in the book, although sometimes I lose track of what I've said where. Um, it's well known that people are very, very bad self-critics. Most of us are not good at identifying our own mistakes. Uh, it's hard to edit your own work. Um, it's hard to admit when you've made a mistake, even when you recognize it. But we're very good at finding fault in others. And so science takes that and, and capitalizes it. So it takes what's kind of a weakness about people and turns it into a strength and says, we invite each other to find fault in each other's work so that it can be corrected. And so I, I think that 
you know, there's a lot of earlier work in history and philosophy of science that really focused on what people used to call the scientific attitude, that the individual scientists had to be, um, you know, curious and hardworking and had to be willing to revise their views in light of new evidence. I think there's some truth in that. I think good scientists do try to be open to new ideas and open to criticism in order to take that criticism on board and make your work better. But at the end of the day, it's not really done by individuals correcting themselves. It's not me sitting in my office saying, okay, now what's wrong with my own work, right? I mean, we do that to some extent, but mostly it's really about subjecting our work to the criticism of others so that it can be corrected and improved. And that is a social process. So it's not something that I do alone. And if you actually look at what scientists do, and this is where I think the social constructionists, um, particularly like Bruno Latour, who's just recently passed, um, made an incredibly important contribution by saying, look, just let's be empirical about this. Let's look at how scientists work. They don't work alone. You know, the image of Descartes sitting alone in his attic watching the, the um, wax melt. I mean, that's not how science operates. If you look at it, you see scientists work in lab groups, often with a lot of people. Uh, they go to conferences with hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of fellow scientists. They submit their papers to peer review, where they'll be read by at least three uh, reviewers who will critique it, also by the editor. It's a highly social process in which people are engaging with them each other all the time. Latour referred to it as an agonistic field. So um, agonistic comes from uh, in anatomy, like the muscles that work against each other in order to work together. So it's, he uses that word very deliberately. It's not antagonistic. We're not out to get each other, although, you know, sometimes people might be, but it's agonistic. There's a pull and a push. There's a tension between me wanting to get my ideas across and probably believing they're right. And you saying, well, hold on, I'm not persuaded yet. And that process is highly social. And what I argue in the book, and this is drawing on feminist philosophers of science like Helen Longino, Elizabeth Lloyd, uh, that that process achieves objectivity because ultimately whatever claims we make have to stand up to the objective scrutiny of lots and lots of different people. So rather than thinking about objectivity as a quality that inheres in an individual, a sort of virtue that either I have or I haven't, and this picture of science, objectivity becomes a social achievement. Let me try and steel man this back to you. <laughs> so okay. make sure. So I've got it and everybody else has it. So it's not that objectivity is created or knowledge is created, but it's better discovered by a diverse community. So that, in other words, you may declare something, oh, I found something, I'm objective, this is knowledge. But it really isn't until it withstands vetting and criticism from many diverse angles. Yeah, because otherwise it's just opinion, right? I mean, okay, yeah. what differentiates scientific knowledge from opinion? I can have an opinion about the world. I can have an opinion about, you know, whatever it is, the earth is flat. But if that opinion can't stand up to scrutiny, then it's just an opinion. But if I collect the data and the evidence to support it, and I share that data and evidence with others who are maybe also collecting evidence of their own, and if over time, all of the people who are working on this question look at the data and say, yes, Actually, the earth isn't flat. It's an oblate spheroid, right? And that process takes time. It's not done overnight. Uh, but to the extent that we do that, we produce knowledge. So we could say that it's a social construction in the sense that there's a social pro process that leads to knowledge as a product. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a real world. It doesn't mean that the knowledge isn't legitimate or valid. In fact, the opposite. It's saying it is legitimate and it is valid. And the reason we think so is because it stood up to this tough critical scrutiny. It's interesting when you say people aren't very good self-critics, but people are very self-critical. <laughs> so I wonder where the disconnect is there. <laughs> oh, well, people are self-critical self in the sense that yeah, I I mean, we, live, we live in a world that encourages us to be self-critical, to make us think we're too fat or too short, or you know, our lives would be better if only we had, you know, if we had blonde hair, we'd have more fun. So we're kind of bombarded by messages that encourage us to be self-critical. But the deep reality is that when it's actually about, you know, admitting a mistake, well, actually, that's why like most of us find really hard. Yes, yeah, two total, same words, different meanings completely. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I want to pivot here a little bit to medical science technologies and values, because some people reject medical science and technologies such as vaccines, or and sometimes they do it with a philosophical or belief-based mm. objection. And right now, there's much going on with genetic disorders and treatment. 
Mm. And that'll be values laden because people may hear that and they may interpret and think it's foreign DNA from one species to another. But really a lot of progress is being made in treating single gene disorders such as Tay-Sachs, sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis. I think I just read something, not, I don't think I did, I know I did on B thalassemia. And that's done with gene genetic editing, meaning that they're correcting the, ge the genetic error in the person with the disease and then giving it back to them. Not the disease, I'm sorry, they're making the correction and then <laughs> via process uh, yeah. uh, giving the corrected gene back to them. But even so, I mean, this is a values-laden issue because people interpret it as a slippery, slippery slope maybe leading to superhumans and a lack of genetic diversity. So is the science of genetics on the cusp of a massive science communication problem? Well, almost certainly yes, because most sciences have massive communication problems because most scientists are poor communicators. And until pretty recently, the scientific community didn't really value taking the time to communicate clearly. They left it to sort of the sort of singular individual, the Carl Sagan, you know, of my era, or maybe Neil deGrasse Tyson today, and sort of said, oh, okay, good. We'll let, we'll, we'll let Carl do that work, but, you know, he's not a real scientist. And there was a kind of disparaging attitude towards scientists who did take the time to communicate. Um, so I think there, there are, there have been for a long time and continue to be substantive problems about science communication, but it's more than just that. There's a much deeper issue that has to do with knowledge of the world and what we do with that knowledge. So as a person who comes out of basic science, I was trained as an earth scientist um, and as a historian of science, I've been very interested in the development of basic scientific knowledge about the planet, about climate change and, and mineral resources and other things. What we learn about the natural world, I would say, are factual things. As we just said before, the earth is not flat. Um, and if you travel around the earth, you don't fall off the way people might have thought you know, in the Middle Ages, right? Um, and if you jump out of a 10-story win window, chances are it's going to be pretty bad news when you hit the ground, right? Unless you're a cat. So there are facts about the natural world, things we've learned through scientific investigations, through experiment, through experience and observation. And our knowledge of those things is pretty robust. It may change in the future as we learn new things. But, you know, if you think about gravity, like we've changed how we think about gravity. So special relativity gives us a different picture of why we have this phenomenon that we call gravity. But at the end of the day, whether you're a Newtonian or an Einsteinian, if you jump out of a 10 story window, you're in trouble, right? So the realities, the hard physical realities, um, you know, well, there's a complicated question in my field, but scientific investigation tells us a lot about how the world works, how it operates. But what we do with that knowledge is a very different thing. So the example that you gave, so we can now use gene editing technologies to cure disease. Should we do it? Is it a good idea? Well, in general, when you talk about the sort of thing that you've just described, single gene editing for specific diseases, some of which are quite dreadful and even deadly, like Tay-Sachs, um, where the person is already alive and can make an informed decision, or in the case of an infant, the parents can make an informed decision, and it can be entirely voluntary, and there's free choice involved. I think that's great. I mean, I think curing a fatal disease, I mean, I, I'm Jewish, so I got tested for Tay-Sachs before I got married. If I had had an infant with Tay-Sachs, I would certainly have welcomed a cure for that disease to save my child. But it gets trickier when things are not entirely voluntary, um, when there's industries involved that might promote disinformation, which I've worked a lot about. Uh, when you start thinking about doing it to people who are not yet born and can't give informed consent. So there's a whole set of ethical issues that begin to kick in. And in my field, many people have argued that the old fashioned fact values distinction is too black and white, that it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny, that you know values penetrate into our interpretation of facts. I think that's true, but I think at the end of the day, the distinction is still a valid one, even if it's blurry at the edges. We can still identify things that are certainly questions of facts, or what Bruno Latour liked to call matters of fact. You know, Is the earth flat or is it an oblate spheroid? That's a matter of fact. But then there are things that are clearly values questions. Should we uh, embark on large-scale gene editing 
uh, processes? Should we focus attention on expensive technologies like this when there are lots of people who don't even have rudimentary basic primary health care? And this came up for me when you know we were at a meeting together in Las Vegas at the um, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. There was a really fun talk by a biologist about all the cool, great stuff that is happening in biotechnology today. And it was true, the examples he gave were great. And he even gave examples of individuals who had been cured. And, and you know, he was saying, this is Jane and her life was saved. Now, of course, that's great. We're all happy for Jane. But what that presentation didn't say, and how much did that cost exactly? And who paid for it? And would that money maybe, maybe have been better spent on primary care, on prenatal care, uh, because it is certainly the case that while there are diseases like Tay-Sachs that can be identified with single genetic determinants, there are far, far more diseases where that's not the case and where things like prenatal nutrition uh, make much more of a difference. And so these are the kinds of value-laden discussions that we need to have and often are missing from many scientific discussions, especially the sort of promotional thing like you know, about look at all the wonderful gee whiz stuff that we've now done with CRISPR. You've just actually led me right where I wanted to go. Um, a single gene right. disorder in someone that has informed consent, but there are also diseases that can be detected genetically at the embryonic stage. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I just learned of retinitis pigmentosa. It can cause loss of vision at a young age and over time, but women can have their embryos tested and then eliminate the ones that may be carrying that disease and keep the others, right? So there's the values question. I mean, how much does that cost? There are a lot of kids that, I don't want to get into too many values here, but there are a lot of kids that need adoption. Well, exactly. I think the point is that we have to have these conversations. And I think it's really easy in the space of science and technology to slip into the gee whiz boosterism. Isn't this fantastic? Um, and some of it is fantastic, but um, there are also really important questions that need to be asked about exactly those sorts of things, and particularly when people can't consent. Now, you might say in that case, it should be up to the woman, the mother, to decide. And as a woman, I would probably agree with that. But obviously, we know there are people in this country who feel strongly against that view. And, and it gets even more complicated still when you begin to think about conditions where there's an argument about whether even it's considered a disorder or should be considered a disorder. So one example that's, I think, a really good one to think about the complexity of these problems is the issue of people who are born uh, intersexual or what we would now maybe call non-binary. So it turns out that a quite surprisingly large number of infants are born with ambiguous genitalia. Some of them are true hermaphrodites. They have both male and female genitalia. Some have some different conditions that could be related to um, genetic effects that cause the receptors for androgens to be um, insensitive. So it's there's a whole array of different things. And these conditions are extremely common. It's something like one in 1,000. When I learned this, I was stunned because as I just said a few minutes ago, I'm Jewish. I knew a lot about Tay-Sachs. I had doctors say, oh, you have to get tested for Tay-Sachs. Tay-Sachs is far less common than um, intersexuality. And yet no doctor that I ever spoke to ever even mentioned to me that this was a possibility that I might want to think about ahead of time how I would uh, prepare for it. And I only learned about it because uh, in teaching, I came across a book about this issue. So it used to be the case that when these children were born, doctors would recommend that surgery be done immediately to correct the ambiguity. And many parents went along with this because they followed their doctor's advice. Today, many people who are themselves intersexed um, find that to have been a catastrophe, that surgery was done on people without their consent and without really fully understanding the character of this condition. I won't call it a disorder. I'll just call it a condition. And now some of these people have grown up and find that they were made into females. For example, if they had inadequate male genitalia, those genitalia were surgically removed. But now they grow up and they are men or they feel themselves to be men. And in some cases, it turns out they have XY chromosomes. So this is an incredibly complicated space. The ethics of it are really multi-layered. And it really speaks to some kind of degree of caution about not making decisions ahead of time um, for fetuses or infants who may, when they grow up, have a different view of the matter than their parents did or their parents' doctors.
I want to move on because I, I, I did have another question about that. I'll just briefly, if anybody wants to do some research, I mean, we're talking about somatic cell gene therapy. Germ cell gene therapy is forbidden. I don't think there's any research going on, but that would be editing at the level of the sperm and egg to really nip the bud and perhaps uh, take care of many genetic disorders, which is, again, values-laden because you're talking about diverse population. Is it a disorder or is it just a condition? Um, do we want to end up... Well, let's not go there. I probably shouldn't even mention that part. <laughs> so let me um, play a little devil's advocate here for you. I'm, I know you get this all the time. For, I'm going to start, though, and say that I think the fact uh, what you've spoken about, the claims to truth uh, made by science, they're subject to being corrected or maybe even thrown out. That kind of, That's what makes science so valuable. It's not married to a dogma or any, usually, or any fact or discovery. You're only one peer away from falsification. <laughs> However, I mean, one or two or something. So, or seven, <laughs> right. But some people argue that's a reason to distrust science, right? Science makes claims to truth that are then overturned. So how can we trust science? And I'm going to do a bit of a gish gallop on you, and, and then you just pick anything you want. So we've heard that aspirin as a primary prevention for cardiovascular disease. Oh, that's been overturned. Statins for primary prevention, not that. Heart stenting for stable angina. Okay, margarine and trans fats, right? We, we, we made margarine because that was supposed to be better than butter. Oh my gosh, 30 years later, what happened? One drink a day is good for you. Oops, nope, zero grams of alcohol. Um, and, and worse than occasionally doing an about face like that, other people argue that science itself is the problem because science brought us eugenics. Science brought us thalidomide babies. Science brought us climate change, leaded gasoline, forever chemicals. Science is nothing more than someone smarter than I am pushing their motivated agenda. Okay. How do you respond okay. to that? Now, I'm not saying that's how I feel. I'm no, just... no, I know. I know. It's okay. fine. No, I get it. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. So what I find really, really interesting is think about the examples you gave. Every one of your examples, at least in the first part, before you went on to the second thing about leaded gasoline, but just stay with the first part okay. of your discussion, they all came from medicine or nutrition. So this is interesting, right? It tells us that something's going on in medicine and nutrition, but it would be a logical error to generalize from that to all science. And the reason I say that is, is for a couple of reasons. So first of all, and I noticed this too, because I do get this question from people. And in fact, this is really why I wrote the book, Why I Trust Science, because people were asking the same thing. And often people would say to me, the way they would put it was, well, why should we trust science when scientists are always getting things wrong? So I would say, well, what's, what example of scientists getting wrong are you thinking of? And the really interesting thing was people often didn't have an example. It was just somehow this like perception that scientists were always getting things wrong. But I think if you look at the history of science, you actually find, no, actually most of the time scientists are getting things right. There are these conspicuous examples that we can point to. And in the book, I engage with some of those examples and I talk about eugenics, for example, but actually we have a giant history of scientists getting a lot of things right. A lot of scientific knowledge has really stood the test of time. So then I probe a little more and what I find is that if they do have an example in mind, it's almost always from nutrition or medicine. So what is that? So I've thought a little bit about this. And I think one of the challenges of medicine is that when people are sick, doctors feel they have to do something. So science has a kind of luxury that medicine doesn't have. And I think it's there's a reason we have different words for these practices, and I'm going to stick with those different words. So if we think of science as an enterprise that is trying to understand the natural world, and that could include basic biomedical science, scientists have the luxury of time. We take our time to answer questions. Really big questions in science don't get an answered quickly. Some of the things I've worked about on, like my first book was on plate tectonics and continental drift. Scientists worked on that problem for, I mean, depending on how you count it, at least 50 years and arguably more like 60, 70, 80 years. So it took a really long time for scientists to settle on the picture of the earth that we now feel pretty confident is likely to hold up for a long, long time. But in medicine, you don't have that luxury. A patient comes to you and the patient is sick and the patient wants care. And so there's a lot of pressure on doctors to say, well, in a way to do the best they can with inadequate data. And so some of those examples you got gave, like aspirin or um, you know one glass of alcohol a day. And by the way, I'm still holding out for the one glass of alcohol a day being good for you. <laughs> so that's my example of motivated reasoning. I definitely want a little bit of alcohol to be okay. Um, but in most of those cases, we actually didn't have enough data. But doctors who felt that they had to say something 
took a stab at it and didn't always do very well at it. So I think it is really important to recognize that medicine has a different set of challenges. The other thing about medicine, and also I'll get to nutrition in a minute, is that frankly, there's a lot of corruption in medicine. You have an industry, big pharma, that is pushing drugs and certain kinds of interventions, often without adequate data. And I do think that the medical community needs to do a lot more work to clean up their act in terms of not guaranteeing, because there's no guarantees in life, but protecting the integrity of biomedical research. We have a lot of evidence of uh, bias and distortion in biomedical science. And the clearest example of that, that's very, very well documented, uh, has to do with tobacco. So we all know today that tobacco causes not just lung cancer, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, emphysema, but more than 200 different serious and in many cases fatal diseases. It took a really long time to prove that. And one of the reasons it took so long was because of tobacco industry disinformation and because of tobacco industry funding of biomedical research. And we have scientific studies that now show that when research was funded by independent researchers, they almost always said, yes, tobacco causes terrible diseases. But when it was funded by the tobacco industry, they often said, well, we don't know, data is insufficient. So a tremendous bias was introduced into research related to tobacco and its harms. That's the clearest example. It's been proven beyond any reasonable doubt. We have numerous studies that show this, but we have similar evidence, not as robust, but about a number of other issues as well. So we really have to think hard about what kinds of practices or safeguards could be put in place. And so some public distrust of science, I think comes from these examples and they're not illegitimate. I think the public does have some reason to be skeptical about certain kinds of medical claims. And I think we saw this during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I would argue this is the biggest reason why the biomedical community and even big pharma actually have a self-interest in protecting the integrity of scientific research. Because if you don't protect the integrity of scientific research, then when you actually have a good product like the COVID-19 vaccine, a lot of people will not believe you. Now, let me just say one more thing. I wanna say something about nutrition. Nutrition has many of the same problems that biomedicine has. There's tremendous distortion uh, of the playing field by interested industries. Uh, you know, think about like the soda industry, for example. So, and we know that there's been a tremendous amount of disinformation in the nutrition space uh, funded by sugar industry, soda, all this sort of thing. But in addition, nutrition is just a really, really tough science. It's really hard to do good work in nutrition uh, for the simple reason that people lie about what they eat. So the standard argument about, uh, say, clinical trials in biomedicine is that the gold standard is the randomized double-blind trial. So that means a trial in which you'll have people doing one thing, people doing another thing. You randomize them so as, as much as possible, you hope that um, the two groups are, are functionally the same except for the specific thing you're trying to study. And then it's double blind. That means the people in the study don't know, you know, which intervention they're getting. So if it's a drug trial, there's the real drug and there might be a placebo. The people in it don't know, so they're not biased by knowledge of what's going on. And the doctors or nurses giving the drugs are, don't know either because studies show that if the doctor knows if I, they're giving you a real drug or a placebo, they might subtly, subtly communicate that to you even if it's inadvertent. Well, you cannot do that with nutrition. You know what you eat, um, you know you know what people are feeding you, you see what's on your plate. And if you're asked about it post hoc, which is the alternative, right? Do some kind of case control study. So if you're asked post hoc about what you eat, people lie. People all deny eating as many French fries as they do. It's why we also can't have good scientific studies about sex. So this makes it extremely difficult to have robust studies of nutrition, but there are alternatives, and the big alternative are population studies, where you look at whole populations. So you compare a country like Greece uh, to the United States, or a country like um, Japan, where they eat you know, a diet that's distinctive and different. And whenever you do that, you actually find the evidence from nutrition is very clear. It's not complicated. And actually, the science writer Michael Pollan summed it up in his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, eat food. That is to say real food, not processed junk, not too much. A lot of us in America eat too much, mostly plants. 
The healthiest diet is a diet that's mostly based on plants. You don't have to be a vegetarian or a vegan, but mostly plants. You try not to eat too much uh, and you try to eat food that is as fresh as possible. It's not actually a mystery, but that message gets drowned out by all the ads telling you that, you know, it's fine to eat these cookies because they're low fat. If we have time, I have at least two questions. Um, one is, I want to ask you um, a historical scientist question. Um, because you mentioned scientists, I mean, the, the evidence against tobacco was dragged down by bias, um, non-independent research. And so we've, uh, when scientists reject science, that's come up in the past several years, but it's hard for me to imagine that the um, 5G industry is paying off a doctor to say that COVID was caused by 5G. Um, so I'm not sure why someone uh, would re- a scientist would reject that evidence most recently, or HIV/AIDS. I, I wonder who's who's creating the bias there. But is there any historical pattern to what fosters a rejection of science? Because personally, I, I've read some history of the polio vaccine, and when it was announced, you know, there were spontaneous when it was announced safe and effective, finally, in 1955, there were spontaneous celebrations, people in the street crying, church bells ringing. I mean, yeah. we went through a massive global pandemic for almost a year before we had a vaccine, even though we knew it was coming. And although people stood outside in lines at mass vaccination sites, I was kind of expecting a hoo-ha, hooray parade like that. Right. What, what was different in history there? Well, the difference was the politics, right? That we've lived for the last 30 to 40 years in an environment that's been highly politicized in which people have deliberately tried to undermine scientific evidence. And this was the whole point of my book with Eric Conway, Merchants of Doubt, that in the last 30 or 40 years, a number of big problems have developed that are related to how we run our country, how we run our economic system. So um, the first one to be, well, the first one really to be recognized were the health harms of tobacco. Um, we live in a market-based economy where companies are free to sell an awful lot of things, even if those products are pretty damaging and pretty harmful. Um, and it's kind of left to the consumer to sort it all out. And the result of that was a massive burden of disease that cost the American people, um, cost states and insurance companies huge amounts of money. And the tobacco industry developed this disinformation campaign in order to keep on the market a deadly product. Now, eventually they failed. Well, actually, I mean, depending on how you look at it, you could say they succeeded because tobacco products are still legal in America, but they're heavily taxed and heavily regulated and far fewer people smoke now than used to. But that template became a model for disinformation in other spheres. And the other spheres that I've looked at most closely all have to do with the environment. So I've looked closely at acid rain, looked closely at the ozone hole, and looked closely at climate change. And in each one of these cases, we saw people challenging the scientific evidence, not because they necessarily had stock in Chevron or ExxonMobil, but because they realized that these problems were pointing out an Achilles heel in our market-based capitalist system, that buying and selling these legal products was damaging the environment to such an extent that in the case of ozone hole, it actually threatened the future existence of life on earth. And most people have forgotten that. They don't realize that if we hadn't fixed the ozone hole, like we would not, well, we would now live in a world where we couldn't safely go outside. And in another century or so, life on earth would have been destroyed because life cannot sustain uh, the bombardment of UV radiation, except for the fact that the ozone layer filters a lot of it out and protects us. So people began to argue against the science because they didn't want to actually have to confront what it would mean politically and culturally for us to really address the failures of our economic system. And that became politically polarized in a red state, blue state way because red states, Republicans, conservatives, generally, this is, you know, first order approximation, but generally were committed to the idea of free market economics that the government shouldn't really be you know, telling us what to buy or where to live or how to how to live um, versus Democrats, progressives and liberals who who believed, no, there's a place for government to get involved and to fix these problems. And so this political divide in our work we showed, it really starts around the time of Ronald Reagan, because there's this sort of historical coincidence, what historians would call a contingency, that Reagan was a president who had a very strong anti-government um, 
position. Some people will remember he famously said, government's not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. So he's very anti-government. He doesn't want to embrace the idea that government should address problems. It should be left to individuals or the private sector. And at the very time that he's pushing forward this view, we're learning for the first time about acid rain in the ozone hole. And so he's very reluctant to accept the scientific evidence because if he does, it challenges his worldview, his sort of political philosophy. And what we've seen over the last 40 years is an amplification, uh, uh, I don't want to say exaggeration, that implies the wrong, but an amplification of that ideological challenge so that today we still see that among, well, among Democrats and people who self-identify as liberals, Democrats, or progressives, vaccination rates are like, I don't know, I mean, here in Massachusetts, it's like 96%. But among Republicans, people who self-identify as conservatives, much less less. And tragically, we've even seen now among people who have died from COVID-19, they're much more likely to be Republicans than Democrats. That to me is a tragedy because there's no reason that those people needed to die. But because the issue was so polarized politically and because it's been framed as the government is bad and therefore government science is bad, and you can't trust science that says we need the government to fix climate change or, or whatever it is, it's become politically polo polarized. And that's a very tragic state of affairs. And it's become literally a matter of life and death. And so when scientists reject the science there... Um... Well, it usually isn't scientists. I mean, what okay. we see... There, and you did say at the... I'm sorry. And you did say at the outset, there are some bad scientists. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So, but I mean, scientists are human beings, so they fall into these ideological traps as well. And that's what we showed in Merchants of Doubt. We were actually interested initially in a group of people who were famous scientists who promoted doubt about climate change and these other issues. And so that was part of the question was, well, obviously they understand the science. They're not stupid people. They're not uneducated. And the answer there was ideology, that they subscribe to the Reagan ideology of limited government uh, individual choice, individual freedom. And that ideology made them resist the scientific evidence of a big problem that really probably needed the government to try to fix. My last question. Okay. From your perspective, and with all the caveats about absolute claims to knowledge being subject to new evidence, what has science shown to be factual that you would be shocked if it were overturned? And by factual, I mean, and I'll quote mm. from your book, established beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, I can think of a lot of things. Uh, the oblate spheroid of the Earth. I think the shape of the Earth is pretty well proven. I think it's extremely unlikely that any future uh, studies will change that. I think the basic, the laws of thermodynamics, uh, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, it's possible. I mean, there are some people in physics who think that maybe there could be some way of understanding it. Uh, but I think, you know, the amount of evidence it seems very unlikely that those will be challenged, but I, I should qualify what I've just said because one's a fact and the other is a theory. So the shape of the earth is a fact, right? This is a question. What is the shape of the earth? The answer is an oblate spheroid. Seems to me extremely unlikely that that will ever be rejected. Thermodynamics is a theory that explains a lot of observations about the world. It's possible that in the future, we might interpret those observations in a different way. And that's what the history of science does show. If we think about, say, Einsteinian physics replacing Newtonian physics, the basic facts don't really change, but they get interpreted in a different way. And so it's certainly possible that the facts that support the laws of thermodynamics may in the future be interpreted differently, but I'm not expecting that to happen in my lifetime. So don't invest in perpetual motion machines incorporated. Correct. Exactly, exactly. You, you've been warned here, everyone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if anyone tells you they have a perpetual motion machine, you should probably suspect that you don't want to take their advice on vaccines either. All right. Dr. Naomi Oreskes, thank you so much for being my guest. Dr. Naomi Oreskes has been my guest here on 502 Conversations. I think this was a great conversation. I greatly appreciate your time. Um, author, scientist, historian, I don't know. How many hats do you wear? There's at least 10 in there. I don't know. Wife, mother, oh. pet owner. <laughs> pet owner, there you go. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.